Uh, so hey everyone, I'm uh, Chris Anderson. Um, one of the things I'll be talking about today is I'm going to do a little bit of an intro about generators and why they're cool for more than we probably think generators are cool for. Uh, and then I've got a demo where I'll be showing a, a, a product that we offer on Azure called Durable Functions. And uh, it has really great support for building stateful orchestrations in Python um, where you can crash them in the middle, all that kind of fun stuff. It's very useful for doing long running tasks that you might be doing as you're building agents or any kind of other thing where you might have something complicated that you need to go through there and build some abstraction over. So let's jump right into that from there. Um, so some of you might be familiar with generators as they are being used for iterators. Uh, generator is actually a very efficient way of building an iterator because it is able to um, you know, leverage all the different kinds of optimizations that are inside of the language to avoid overhead of putting extra things on the stack, things along those lines. So if you are going to build an iterator, definitely reach for a generator, but generators can be used for so much more. So let's go through there and take a look at the rest of the generator surface area that does not appear in this lovely diagram uh, that we have here. Um, so the real question there is, are generators simply iterators, right? We get an iter, we get, an, we get an, a dunder iter, a dunder next. Uh, you know, why do I need to even use generators instead of just using these things in the first place? The, you know, let's go look at some examples. So this is kind of, you know, classic case of I've got my you know, range function. Let's say I want to build a custom range function. Well, what would that look like? I want to take in a lambda. That lambda is going to, uh, you know, allow me to go through there and customize this step on every single call for whatever I want it to be. So I can build random steps, whatever it is. What would this end up looking like as a generator? So to, you know, uh, this is itself a generator. The key thing of what a generator is and how you know it's there is you've got a yield call. That's it. And I'm able to go through there and build a very quick custom range. We go through there and we run that. And we now go through there and able to build our own little custom range. That's cool. Well, let's get fancier in how we can make generators work. This is another uh, dynamic range. Uh, or here's another dynamic range. Uh, I've got another uh, lambda that I'm doing here. And now I don't need to set an end value. So that's another cool thing that you can do with a custom generator is you don't necessarily need to have an ever end. That iterator could just keep on going for forever until the end of time. And importantly, we'll know that because will I ever be called is a nice little hint for us. So let's go through there and run this and see if it'll ever be called. Nope, it's still not called. Still not called at a million. Uh, OK, so we need to give that sweet release, right? If we never end that generator, that's always going to be there. As I go through there and run my application more and more, I always have these instances of generators laying around, even if I'm done pumping them. So how do I go through there and actually uh, handle a uh, iterator being done? Well, we can handle that cleanly with this generator exit uh, you know, handler. And we can signal to the generator that it should trigger an exit. So we can see uh, in our implementation of this, we have our four and we have a little break statement. And we're going to call this close method. So some of you may have never even looked at the close method on an iterator before, but that is how you can go through there and actually terminate an iterator so it'll no longer yield new results to you when you try to pump it one more time. So now, when I call close, I get my nice little yay sweet release method printed for me. This generator can go to sleep and have a good night. Um, but one other really interesting thing about generators is that they aren't just one way. Most people think about generators as the thing that's going to yield you results but you are able to send results back into the generator. And this is where things start to get very interesting. Um, so I've got the same kind of general pattern here uh, where I'm going to forever effectively just increment the number that I'm passed by itself plus one. And so I, the key thing that is different for a generator that you can send things into is there is a left-hand side on the other side of the yield statement that I've got here. And this is going to listen for input after it's yielded the first results. This actually leads to a very interesting behavior where in order to send results, you need to prime the iterator. And so I am going to, in this case, uh, prime that iterator by calling next once. And I'm not going to be actually expecting to get any uh, you know, real results as far as like being able to then send things back into it. So I'm going to pump it. I'm then going to go through there and run my iterator where um, I'm going to be sending this result in here. And I can see that I'm getting back this kind of incremental 2x pump through this thing. Um, and that is because I'm able to send numbers back to it. Um, obviously, I could build this particular number range without ever sending numbers back into it. Um, but the key thing here is that I can use this send method for interesting things. So one of those interesting things ends up being building orchestrations. Um, before we had async IO and async await and all those different things, this was actually one of the primary ways by which we did asynchronous tasks was scheduling them using a scheduling framework for asynchronous work. 
So let's go through there and in a relatively short period of time, build our own custom you know, async kind of task scheduling orchestrator using these patterns that we just learned. So here's a very simple orchestration. A is called, the results of A is passed to B and C, and the results of B and C are passed to D. Seemingly simple, but this is actually the cause of many different lifesite outages for any of the services you might have used out there because there, any of these failure points can actually result in the complete failure of the system. And do you wait on one? Do you wait on the other? It's a tricky thing, actually, surprisingly, to go through there and build this in a robust, resilient way. Each one of these failure points, A, B, and C, creates an interesting new failure. Let's go through there and look at what that looks like. We're going to simulate a flaky activity in this particular case. So it's going to be a random number. And if that random number is less uh, than a particular value, I am going to, uh, less than or equal to one, I'm going to fail. So this is a one in a hundred chance that I'm going to see a failure every time that this activity is called. And so this is my orchestration, A, B, C, D, and I'm going to return D. Easy enough, right? Uh, here's my little method where I'm going to call this for a number of times, uh, and we're going to kind of print out the final results. Let's see what we get. So at the end here, it wasn't a 1% failure rate. What we actually see is that we get a 4% failure rate because each one of those steps could possibly fail 1% of the time. It's additive. We get a 4% failure rate. So this is not a 99% availability. I get a 96% availability. That's no good. What can we do to improve the, the availability of this? Well, let's take a look. Um, we're going to break up the tasks themselves to isolate failures, and that allows us to then treat each failure independently. That's the ideal thing to go and do. Now, you could go through there and handle this by having each one of those A, B, C calls wrapped in its own try, retry, catch logic, and things along those lines. But that makes my code harder to understand, my orchestration harder to understand. I want to keep that nice, pretty looking A, B, C, D code. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to invent this concept of a durable activity. And what this takes is effectively very simple kind of thing I'm going to push onto the stack. I've got a function call that I want to make, and I've got args that I want to pass to that function. And I've got, in this case, a, a flaky activity that is going to be called when I go ahead and I uh, call this durable activity in the first place. So I run this thing here. I have my durable activity. This code looks the exact same, except for instead of calling flaky activity, I'm calling durable activity. And I'm yielding that durable activity out uh, of the orchestrator. I go through there. I have now my durable orchestrator itself, which is now handling the try catch loop for me and doing retry. So I can centralize all that retry logic into a single place rather than having it replicated for each one of those individual steps. Let's go through there and run this with a fairly similar step to go through there and get what the results were. I'm now going to capture each individual failure as well as the total end failures and, and catch what those things look like. So I go and run this, and I can see that I end up with now a failure rate of 1.02, of fairly close to 1% for all intents and purposes. So by handling those retries themselves, I'm actually getting back to that 1% failure rate on the total activities in the first place because I'll end up with cascading failures. That's a very interesting kind of pattern where now it's only failing once on any particular one of those workflows. And so I'm getting closer to that 1% rate. And what's really important here is that my total failures of the thing end to end is now at zero because every single time that it ha has a failure, whether it repeats itself twice or three times or more, it is going to keep on trying until it succeeds eventually. And no one of those individual at flicky activities hurts the rest of the activities. They're all isolated from one another and durably retried. Um, so that's all good. Um, but we can make that fancier. So now let's make this more generic, right? So now instead of having to um, like build my own custom durable wrapper around these flaky things, I'm going to build a generic one. And I'm going to have my own little kind of custom call stack that I maintain and call account that I maintain. I'm going to build my durable orchestrator to use those generic concepts. And so this is going to now get a little bit more complicated. I uh, don't need to read all of this code to understand it. But this is effectively about making it more generic to now call things that are on my stack. And now I can go through there, and as I'm writing my logic, just focus on these two functions. I've got my flaky activity, which might fail sometimes. Think of this, again, as like a remote API I might be calling, and that remote API might fail sometimes that I call it, and I want this to still survive an individual API call to a remote service that I might be doing. And um, this is the same code as it was before, except for now I'm wrapping that flaky activity with this durable activity and passing the flaky activity into that durable activity. So now I could call different flaky functions. I don't need to go build a custom one, you know, custom stack for each time. Let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. And uh, we can see here that I can actually, one other thing that I'm adding here is uh, we're going to call this and I've passed a secret number here. I didn't call, I didn't talk to this. A secret number called restart zero. 
which basically will go through there and restart the entire orchestration every time that I hit that number that I passed along in there at least once. So that way I need to go through there and prove that when I restart the thing, I resumed from where I last started. I don't go through there and repeat the process. So going through here, I can see that if I run it the first time where there is no restart happening, uh, I get one, uh, one four, two, 64, 390, and four, 182. So this is my sequence of numbers I expect to always get. I'm gonna go through there and run the other times, and you can see that each time I'm getting the same numbers between on the restart itself, and so I'm actually durably stay, or staring, uh, sh storing the results from each one of those flicky activities. So when I go and resume it and I replay the orchestration entirely, I'm actually seeing the exact same results. I don't need to go through there and actually get new random numbers out of the system. So it is now durable in that sense. Now, the thing that you would do here is like, this is actually, this is obviously still all in memory. What you would be doing is adding in this particular state here, you'd be saving this to some external storage, file system, remote database, et cetera. So that way, if the process entirely crashed, in this case, if it, memory crashes, it's gone. But if I can externalize this to an external store, which is, you know, uh, going to be reasonably reliable, I can now go through there and resume that from any machine. It doesn't even need to be the same machine I was just on, and it will go through there and keep on chugging. And this also allows me to then schedule those activities on other machines, so I could have a single orchestration machine and fan out to many, many different activity machines and use that for kind of coordinating things using that same external state storage. So really quick, we built that. Let's go through there and look at what a more sophisticated system looks like by actually looking at a live demo. Um, so maximize this. Uh, and just confirming that that didn't somehow break StreamYard or anything. Emily, look good still? All right, I'm gonna say it looks good still. Um, demoing this on a remote desktop because internet is a little bit flaky and I'm gonna run this on my uh, remote desktop that's running in the office somewhere in Seattle. So my internet is nice and stable. Um, so what I've got here is I've got a durable function. Um, you can see that the code looks very much the same as what I was just building in that little sample. Um, but this is actually using a framework called Azure Durable Functions and using those types instead. And it's a much more sophisticated, properly developed out wrapper of those things. Uh, and then I've got my flaky activity. Looks more or less the same thing. What I've added in this case is a time.sleep because I want to kind of be showing you that it's handling these long running tasks and, and things like that with my little demo. And then I've got a little HTTP function that I've created here. So that way I can trigger this orchestration nice and simply uh, with just a single call. So this is what the code looks like. This is already running here on this uh, machine. This is running locally, but you can deploy this to the cloud and run it on the cloud. The, store, the, the, state, uh, the state that this is using is out on the cloud. So I could actually be running this alongside the one that's running on the cloud using the same state storage. They all coordinate with each other. So let's go and look at my shell here. Uh, so what I'm going to do, not a very flashy demo, so we're going to have to be satisfied with some curl commands, but I'm going to invoke that functions uh, endpoint here with a curl command. And it's going to return to me effectively an ID that I've saved. I'm going to uh, go ahead and get my status URI from those results that I just got. And I'm going to now um, uh, just take a look at, uh, uh, I'm going to go through there and pull that to see what the results are. You can see I've got this running method. So this, uh, the, the nice thing with the durable functions is that it comes with an external API for pulling the state of the system, running, failed, outputs, all those different pieces. And I can keep on calling this. And in this case, it completed in the time that I was just talking there. Um, and it completed all the steps and it gave me my end result, which you can see that the end result in this particular case is 335. So nice and easy way of building these things. If you yourself are looking, you've got a bunch of Python code, you need to build an operational long running activity that might end up needing to span, you know, whether it's minutes or hours. This is a great way of building a very long running task that you need to be able to go through there and continue to get state from, from a system. That's a great thing as we're building more um, agentic experiences that might be trying to model external processes that take a very long time. Um, Azure Functions has a built in MCP uh, trigger support for it. So you can actually build these things instead of the HTTP trigger, build an MCP trigger, go through there and get the MCP endpoint to your agent, and their agent is able to directly interact with the uh, durable function that you just saw here. And that was a fairly quick, I managed to fit within my time demo, uh, very quickly learning a new way of using generators, learning how you can use that to build durable orchestrations. And then uh, what you just saw here is available right now if you, you know, do a search in your favorite search engine for um, Azure durable functions. You'll go through there and see some great Python examples that we have for making that work that leverages the orchestrator that I just showed you here. And if you have questions, feel free to ask me questions. But, you know, that's the that's the content. 
That's a great question. Um, the question was, is Azure Functions, is it an open source project? The Durable Functions part is an open source project. Uh, so yes, if you go through there, Azure Functions, Durable Functions, GitHub, you can see that um, all of Azure Functions is effectively a, a core with extensions. So Durable Functions is actually an extension on Azure Functions. And so that is actually you know, uh, here, um, open source entirely. And then the um, Python part itself is actually um, then inside of like a worker. So we have the core logic, you know, state storage, et cetera, available inside of the Durable extension here. And then the Python logic, which is basically a kind of a wrapper over some of these APIs that allows you to express yourself in those terms. Um, that's another uh, uh, repository, but that's also open source. So the extension support, like, I have it on Azure, so I state matters. Yeah, the ex extensions is just how um, Azure Functions builds its components. So you can build your own custom extension to Azure Functions, for example. If you want to build your own custom trigger or bindings or whatever, if you want to add your own language support, all of their models are open source. In fact, the only thing that's not open source is like their scale controller, because it's so specific to how it's run in Azure. But all of the actual like stuff that you run locally, all the code you write, everything there is open source for Azure Functions. Mm -hmm. uh so the API that you showed about the state, even that part is good. That, that is what um, the, the core extension offers the state management and the API for invoking and retrieving results from, uh, from things. So all of that stuff is open source. I can deploy it like, in my own web system. Yeah, like the, we actually have um, uh, templates for going through there and deploying Azure Functions into Kubernetes, you know, running wherever you'd like to. The key thing is for state storage, uh, it only has a couple of different options for state storage. The easiest one to use is Azure storage. So like you could run it on-prem, but with a remote connection to Azure storage, and it would work just fine there. And then there's a couple of like bring your own storage things that are just a little bit less configurable that the docs can help answer for you. Uh, so the docs for durable functions, if you just search for Azure uh, durable functions, so the one where we can deploy it a lot works to Kubernetes. Yeah, so Azure Functions on K Kubernetes. Um, so we've got Azure Functions on Kubernetes with Kita. So Kita is like the framework that we deploy onto functions for managing these particular pieces. And Kita has support for durable functions and how it deploys to Kubernetes. Yeah, databases. The databases themselves all would be independent things. You got to look at which ones deploy. So like Postgres, for example, easily, de uh, easily deploys. Cosmos does not, for example, have a like, Kubernetes deployable version of itself. There is Kubernetes like um, operators for doing like you can treat Cosmos DB a remote endpoint like it is you know a uh, service inside of Kubernetes, but it's a remote service. It's not like a, a, you know in the Kubernetes. So if you needed to be entirely on prem, like isolated from the cloud, you need to use something like you know SQL Server or Postgres for those things. Yeah, no problem.